What a pleasure to be celebrating 75 years of EULAR's history. It's my great privilege to have the opportunity to reflect on the changes that have occurred in rheumatology during that extraordinary journey. These are my relevant disclosures. Let me start by considering different areas in which our discipline of rheumatology has advanced. And I'm going to start with a reflection on what the rheumatic diseases used to look like. Here depicted in the art of Renoir, who suffered from severe destructive rheumatoid arthritis, despite which he was able to produce art of exquisite quality, yet only through physical modifications and structural aids, sadly let down by the medical therapies of his time. And we don't have to look so far back here just three decades to an article in The Lancet in which David Scott and Debbie Simmons reflected on the very small proportion of patients who were ever able to achieve remission, conceived at that time as a fallacious idea. Our therapeutic response to a set of diseases that were associated with dreadful destruction of tissue, loss of quality of life, quality of lives of families, costs to society, costs to individual futures, was when one thinks about it rather primitive. We used herbal remedies, drugs chosen to modify the immune system, not because those parts of the immune system that were driving disease were understood, but rather because they were general, broad immune suppressants, characterized best by glucocorticoids invented in the middle of the 20th century. The pyramid of care that we all learned was based on the idea that we were afraid of drugs and delayed intervention until such times as we were certain that individuals needed aggressive treatment. What changed? What brought about the revolution in medical therapeutics and rheumatology? Well, it was a recognition that understanding the immune system and its role in infection, and then increasingly in the immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, could potentially offer therapeutic gain. It took around half a century for us to move from conventional synthetic disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs such as sulfasalazine, gold, followed by the introduction of methotrexate, and then around the turn of the century with the advent of biologic therapeutics. At the front, the use of TNF inhibitors, followed by a range of extraordinary and exquisitely selective medicines designed to change the misbehavior of the immune system. The TNF blocking drugs, molecular scalpels if you like, were selected to intervene and prevent the inflammatory effects of TNF. Five medicines arose within a short number of years and thereafter many biosimilars have come subsequently. These medicines changed the lives of people with rheumatoid arthritis. But then we realized that these biologic interventions also changed the lives of people with a range of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. Psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. And so the journey of discovery continued, revolutionizing lives through an understanding of basic pathogenesis. This was achievable with safety in mind. And it soon became evident that the balance of benefit and potential risk strongly favored aggressive intervention with highly and exquisitely specific immune targeting medicines. The revolution had begun. Investigating mechanisms of disease, of course, requires that we understand what a disease is. And so a further major advance 
led by global organizations, with ULAR at the fore, working particularly with the American College of Rheumatology, was to classify diseases. Now, classifications are not diagnoses. Classifications bring together a collection of symptoms and signs that are commonly recognized to constitute a disease. This is essential if we are to capitalize on the underlying pathogenesis investigations to build new medicines. And so working in partnership across the world and across Europe, we classify diseases, publish them with international consensus, and so brought the community together to permit remarkable advances. When one is intervening, in clinical trials especially, it is equally vital that one measures outcomes and agrees on what those outcomes mean. And so, as important as classification of disease, was the idea that we agree common outcome measures, the achievement of which would permit the approval of new medicines. And so a whole range of outcome measures have emerged across the rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, captured here, for example, in the ULAR repository for the same. Those outcome measures transformed clinical trialing, allowed consistent estimation of the impact of new medicines, and also, as I shall shortly disclose, new strategies, approaches to the treatment of these dreadful diseases. It seems extraordinary as we reflect on our daily routine approach to the treatment of RMDs, that there was ever a time when we didn't give careful consideration to strategic use of the medicines at our disposal. I mentioned originally the therapeutic pyramid that we, well, many of us learned at medical school. How things have changed. First and foremost was the recognition that early intervention had a remarkable impact on outcomes in the short, but crucially also in the longer term. And from this grew the idea of a window of opportunity in the interventions that could change the course of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. The concept of the window of opportunity is that an earlier intervention will allow recovery of immune disease control, but also preserve function, whereas later intervention may still allow reduction of inflammation, but not ever recovery of function. With apologies to John Milton, function lost, never regained. We don't yet understand the pathogenetic underpinnings of this, but we do understand very well its clinical consequences. Early intervention, early diagnosis, early commencement of effective management is always to the benefit of our patients. From this came the idea that standards of care across our communities would be critical. And so recommendations and guidelines have emerged from a whole range of international organizations. You'll forgive me on ULAR's 71st birthday for mentioning the ULAR recommendations efforts. And here you see the depictions of recommendations across several major rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases. But recommendations are also now increasingly being considered alongside the cost of the delivery of care. And so increasingly, ULAR and other transglobal organizations must consider the cost of care. It's not acceptable that people cannot afford effective treatment delivered when they most need it. And so we work together as international societies with our newfound knowledge to deliver that which is needed when it can most offer positive outcome. In addition to commencing early therapeutics, a major advance in the last two decades has been the idea that we treat to a therapeutic target, an idea originally borrowed from diabetic and hypertension 
we conceive the idea that treatment to a specific disease activity level, low disease or preferably remission, would improve outcomes. And so commenced the treat to target revolution. Treat to target based on the idea that communication between the health professional and the person with rheumatic musculoskeletal disease should occur regularly, perhaps every month or three months. And if disease control was not achieved, therapeutic escalation should be continued. Treat to target revolutionized the outcomes for many of our patients. Treat to target that shared decision-making between the patient and the healthcare professional led to at least as big a revolution as the advent of new molecular entities, even and including biologics and targeted synthetic disease-modifying drugs. Treat to target also comprises the notion that we treat the whole person, not just their rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease. We treat the comorbidities that affect our patients of the cardiovascular system, of bone, and particularly of the mind. That increasing recognition in the last few decades that RMDs are diseases associated with significant depression, anxiety, and now by recognizing that, the opportunity to intervene and improve outcomes further. Holistic care, treating people and not patients. And finally, the revolution that will move from treat to target, T to T to D to T, difficult to treat disease. Difficult to treat why? Well, because we neither recognize nor defined it. And so rather recently, ULAR has defined difficult to treat rheumatoid arthritis in the hope that we can build strategies that will cross that final frontier for those who still languish without appropriate relief of their symptoms and signs. So far, I've reflected on pathogenesis-driven interventions, classification of diseases, outcome measures that revolutionize trials, and also thought a little bit about the changes in the strategic approach to the management of RMDs. All of this relied on underpinning technology embraced by the rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases community over many years. From the early days, we used antibody technology, rheumatoid factor, ANA, double-stranded DNA, ACPA, to improve our understanding of disease and all of the underlying immune pathogenetic technologies that underpinned the advent of new interventions, biologic drugs, targeted synthetic disease-modifying and anti-rheumatic drugs. Technologies were also very evident in our use of imaging. Of course, for the duration of ULAR's existence, we had X-rays, but more recently embracing the use of ultrasound, MRI, and increasingly molecular level imaging, PET scanning and the like. Rheumatology was at one point considered something of a backwater, an area where technology was slowly embraced and imperfectly utilized. We see over the last 75 years a transition, a transformation. Rheumatology now at the very forefront of molecular medicine using state-of-the-art imaging, state-of-the-art diagnostics, and state-of-the-art discovery methods to advance the cause of our patients. What an extraordinary 75 years. And of course, perhaps for me, the most important development has been our message. That which we needed to say to the world about people with RMDs. And so, we have built an extraordinary communication and advocacy program in our community. The ULAR Congresses. Since 2000, these have been annual events, festivals of extraordinary interactions, as we have come to understand more about our diseases, taught more about them, and provided the premier educational opportunity for people across our discipline and across our disciplines, plural, doctors, scientists, health professionals, and patients, 
all coming together to celebrate rheumatology and to advance knowledge and understanding of disease, truly a place where the world meets. But with that, we grew in confidence. And so we have come to advocate on behalf of our patients across Europe on behalf of the ULAR community, changing our name eventually to a European alliance, a gathering of societies, of doctors, of health professionals, of patients, building the RUMA map, an outline of the unmet needs facing our patients, talking to parliaments, talking to those in authority, those with the power to make the changes that we require. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. Let us rejoice in the extraordinary advances of the last 75 years of ULAR's life, pathogenesis-led interventions, a revolution in therapeutic strategies, early intervention, targeted intervention, in diseases properly classified and globally agreed, and advocating on behalf of people with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, repeating the message to all who will listen and all who can change lives that their lot matters. Our Greek friends always remind us that rheumatology comes from the original rheuma, flow. What an extraordinary sequence of events have flowed through the last 75 years as technology met innovation, met clinical need, bringing us to this present day. I'm sure you'll join me, therefore, in wishing Ular a very happy birthday.